Hey, uh, thanks for being here. Good to have you. Uh, good to have you out on this uh, hot August uh, Sunday morning. Um, had a variety of calls of folks saying, Pastor, we are going to take advantage of our last weekend before we go back to work. So we got a lot of school teachers who are enjoying some uh, time off this weekend. I hope they come back renewed, refreshed, and ready for all those kids next week and the following week. All right. Some of you have already started, right? There's a few of you. I think Central got, uh, got kicked off this past week. I know I had a Central teacher in the early service. But uh, anyway, glad you're here today. Um, if you are a guest today, your first time to visit with us, there are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would be so honored if you would take one out, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. We make some promises here. We will never beat on your door. We will never uh, pester you on a telephone, but through snail mail, all right? old-fashioned mail. We're going to send you information about the church, about the staff, about the services we have, ministries that you might be interested in, and hopefully that will answer most of your questions. And if not, certainly give, a, give us a call and we'll be happy to do our best to answer those questions. Let me highlight some announcements very, very quickly, and uh, then I've got a, kind of a lengthy uh, prayer request time uh, for today. First off, though, let me ask a question. How many of you have noticed something different as you arrived at church today? Okay, uh, first thing, how many of you noticed something different inside the sanctuary? All right, the wall behind me is painted, if you didn't recognize, a different color than it was last week. All right, so hopefully you noticed that. Now, what you might not notice is the side walls and all the trim have also been painted the very same color they were before. All right, so you might not have recognized that, but um, we now don't have holes and skin places on it. All right, so... Uh, that looks good. But how many of you drove in the parking lot saw something different? Okay, how many of you didn't? That means all the rest of you who didn't raise your hand on the first question. All right, here's the deal. There's a very important principle at work here. For believers, you always should live a life looking up rather than down. If you had been looking up, you would have seen something new. Picture, please. Ed Murbach is smiling down from heaven today saying, thank you, Tim, you kept your promise. For those of you who have no idea who Ed Murbach is, Ed Murbach is the fine, fine gentleman who built this building, all right? He was a retired general contractor. He was a member of the original New Hope before the merger 25 years ago. This building was built 27 years ago. One of the very first things that Ed Murbach said to me when he gave me a tour of the property, he said, I hate the steeple. But that's all I was allowed to build. The steeple literally was eight inches. That's what used to be up there, eight inches. I had steeple envy, all right? Every other church in town that had a good steeple, I was envious. I, I, I got angry every time I drove by them. Um, so this past week, we got, uh, and then probably a month before Ed passed away, he said, Tim, keep that promise. We have now kept the promise. We have not only a steeple, but we got a cross on our steeple, all right? Woo! I love it. I love it. Uh, all right, on to the announcements. Uh, tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, over in the bridge, we're going to have the last of our summer sizzling Sunday night services. All right? Uh, this has been a trial run for us, just getting some kinks worked out. After the Labor Day weekend, we are going to consistently have Sunday evening services here. Um, just because you come on Sunday morning doesn't mean you have to come on Sunday night. Just because you come on Sunday morning doesn't mean you can't come on Sunday night, all right? Sunday night is a whole different service. It's not a duplicate of the morning service. It's its own kind of service. It is designed to be a bit more, more informal. It is designed to give uh, other people in our congregation opportunities at leadership in, the ser in services. It is designed to blend generations more than we are able to do in our three Sunday morning services. Uh, it is designed to be more participatory than, uh, than spectative, all right? Um, and so we've attempted to do that in our previous services uh, this year. It's time to generate greater fellowship. Uh, during our summer Sunday night services, we have kind of focused on what's summertime for. And we've looked at rest uh, and recovery. We have looked at joy and laughter. And we're going to wrap things up tonight with some reflection. Summer is a time in which the church is significantly engaged in camp. You all have been responsible for helping to provide the resources so that over a hundred kids from New Hope Church could go to camp this year, all right? 
uh, that's his high school camp, junior high camp, and our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade surf program camp. And so tonight, some of those kids are going to give a testimony of what camp meant to them this year. There may be a parent or two that are going to share a testimony of what their kids have shared with them that camp has meant to them this year. You're going to hear from a few of your pastoral staff of what camp meant to them in the past and a change that maybe happened in their lives. So it'll be a little testimony time along with some, some, some good worship time tonight. So 6 to 7 to 7.15 and uh, hope to see you come out and join us tonight. All right. And that'll be over in the bridge. Hope you can make it. Ladies, fun. You got your table out front, oh, out in the pavilion, you're selling tickets for the big ladies movie, I think there it is, all right, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, that is a great, great movie, you can't beat the price, Fawn got it for a buck, a dollar for a ticket, go out to the table, buy your ticket, um, they've kind of cooperated with men's ministries a little bit, and men are going to have an event that day as well. They're going to have a rib and chili cook-off. If you've got great recipes for either or both of those, you want to enter them into the competition, you can do that. On top of that, they are going to be barbecuing and making tri-tip dinners. So here's the way this works. When the ladies finish their movie and they will have had snacks, chocolate, popcorn uh, in here, you can walk right out those doors into the pavilion. You'll have the smell of chili and ribs out there. And there will also be tri-tip dinners that one... You can eat here, have your husband or family members or good friends join you here for dinner right after the movie's over, or you can purchase dinners to take home with you, uh, or go to the park for a romantic interlude on your way home, all right? So we've provided you all kinds of options. Now, last week, if you were here last week, you know that Fawn threw the gauntlet down to the men for their shabby table, all right? They... Oh, you have a picture of last week? Okay, let's see last week's picture. Okay, look at that, all right? <laughs> Mars versus Venus. Nice tablecloth, bags, poster, and then there's Mark at the men's table. There's, there's Mark, all right? Um, today, oh, you got a picture? So the men took it seriously, so they got busy this week. So, the tables have been turned, excuse the pun. That's actually, they're barbecuing sausages out there at the men's table. You can go with a toothpick and have a sausage. Do not do it during service. Wait till after service. All right, but anyway, yes. And I want to give a hand to the men at that table. That's a beautiful table. Mark? I mean, they usually do these tablecloths. They're cooking. I mean, I think it's so cute that they want to be like us. <laughs> on a church, huh? All right. All right. Terrific. Let's see here. Uh, I think I've covered all it. So go out and buy your tickets today. Oh, uh, I don't know where the other clipboard is. There should be another one around here somewhere. If not, this one needs to get to the back and come around and end up at the front. There is going to be a big event at uh, Fresno State on the holiday weekend of September. Uh, it is September 2nd, I think it is, a Fresno State football game and tailgating. And there are some special things I just found out are going on. Uh, Bobby Glazeberg is going to be in town. He's going to be honored as part of the 1977 football team that's being inducted into a Hall of Fame. And the Carr brothers are going to be there. And so it would be a great 
great football game. You can get tickets for $13, and that also gives you the privilege of going to a tailgating event that is being put on by the Men and Women's Equipping Network in the community of Fresno and Clovis. And so if you are interested in purchasing a ticket to the game and enjoying some fine tailgating, then put your name and your contact information and how many tickets you would like, and Mark will contact you for that. All right? So that sign-up sheet is going around. Um, we will have a church business meeting the last Sunday of August. It will be at between 12.15 or 12.30, uh, depending on how long uh, the preacher goes that day. And uh, within about 10 minutes after the last service is over, we will meet back in here for a probably 30-minute business meeting. Uh, for our church family, it's important for a couple of reasons. We have uh, reignited and revived our deacons ministry in the church. It's a ministry of service and care. And uh, they've worked very hard for the last 18 months in terms of kind of revising our thoughts and our process for that. And we've had several folks uh, uh, who were interested and they've been through uh, a, a brief class and they've been through uh, filling out a, a, an application saying, I think we'd like to do this. And then a rigorous, a very rigorous interview process with Brian Ermer and Phil Panos, they just, I mean, those are IRS guys. I mean, they're just grueling, all right? <laughs> uh, and anyway, they have passed through uh, the Elder Board's approval process, and we want to present them to our entire church family. Uh, it's a group of men and women that we would like your, uh, your approval for. Uh, on top of that, we're going to bring you up to date on where we are with the remodeling project, all right? I mean, you can see most of it, but we want to bring you up to date where we are financially in that. And then I have a favor to ask of you, and it will require a vote of our church membership, all right? Uh, you gave us permission to spend whatever we wanted to in the building fund that we currently have to do what needs to be done in the sanctuary. We've just about done that, all right? Uh, the bathrooms have been remodeled. Uh, the stage has been remodeled. Uh, we put rock on the wall. We've redone sound effects here. Uh, we're going to add a little bit more lighting uh, uh, for the stage to make things a little better there. And then we're pretty well wrapped up. So we want to bring you up to date on what we have spent, all right, and what we have left. And then the permission I'm going to ask is um, those bathrooms in that building are horrible, okay? They are almost on the border of deplorable. Um, and so, um, I would like us to go ahead and finish off, all right, by remodeling those. Um, and sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes I make a few decisions where I will ask forgiveness later rather than permission on the front end. Um, but I do have a dollar amount that I probably will not exceed. And to remodel bathrooms exceeded that dollar amount that... I want permission first, all right? So uh, we'll share all that with you, and that will be on the last Sunday of August. So hope you can come out and join us for that. Let me uh, please take note of grief share start times and financial peace. It's a Bible study on finances. Both of those have kickoff dates coming up very, very soon. Let me update on several prayer requests. Linda Bropes from our church. Now you need to understand, Linda is, her brother just passed away earlier this year. Uh, and her mother passed away exactly one year ago, the same month as her brother did. So the Bropes have been through a lot. Um, Linda had an MRI because she was having some pain in her hip, and it shows lesions on her hip. So tomorrow she goes in for two CAT scans at 9.15 and at 12.45. At this point we have no idea what those lesions on her hip are, uh, but it is a matter of concern. So please be praying for her as she goes through the testing process, and then awaits the results of what that is. We have some good news today from someone in our church family who went through some tests and got really good news. Joni Jarbo, uh, back row Joni. All right, hi Joni. All right. Uh, anyway, Joni got great news that uh, all the tests came back negative for cancer. So she is cancer-free. <laughs> cancer-free. And we rejoice for that. Mrs. Levendusky from our church also went through some uh, surgical procedures this past week. I have not heard the results of those yet, so I do not know what the answer to that is. But please be praying for the Levenduskin family as they go through this. A couple of weeks ago, we prayed for uh, the Clay's son who was going into the Marine Special. His name is Nick, going into special operations for the Marines. Uh, he went in this past week, all right? So continue to pray for him as he goes through that training. Uh, Helga and Otmar's grandson, Zachary, leaves tomorrow for the Air Force Special Operations Training Program. So they are requesting prayer for his son as well. Patty Lewis from our church, she was in the 8 o'clock service with her husband Rick. Her dad is under hospice care in Bakersfield. Uh, I drove down on Wednesday late afternoon, early evening. 
uh, visited with her dad, had an opportunity to pray with him. He was uncertain if he knew Jesus Christ personally or not. We had the opportunity to visit with him. He was still very sharp and alert uh, to ask him some questions. And the end result is he prayed to make sure that Jesus Christ is alive in his heart. So we're very excited about that. And so that makes Patty very happy. Uh, the following day, Patty was asked to leave by uh, her uh, dad's wife, all right, um, and not return. Um, there is just some there's, some, there's some relational difficulties there uh, that are challenging. Uh, they've been married about five or six years, and uh, so the, the, there's... The, they're just challenges. So please remember to pray for Patty as they go through this. Jean Montgomery, regular part of our church family. Uh, her daughter, Tammy Price, uh, came back from vacation very, very ill. And the diagnosis this past week was that she has valley fever. So uh, she spent a couple of days in the hospital. She has been released to go home. But it will be a couple of months before she has recuperated from valley fever. Um, the Rudy Alicorn family, I have a service for them on Wednesday. Uh, we have a service here on Thursday for um, um, a gentleman from our congregation, Rick Watt. And that service is Thursday. And then we have one here, not today, but next Sunday afternoon for a 17-year-old young man, Hunter Lamar. Um, this has been a challenging week for your staff here at the church. Uh, we have received calls with, of seven deaths this week. From 6 months old, 12 years old, 17 years old, 25 year old, and then older. So it's been a, a challenging time. So we would appreciate all of your prayers as we prepare for these. Continue. Remember to pray for the Shasky family. Services for his dad were last week. So uh, Nancy Horton from our church also had knee surgery this past Friday. So she is home recuperating. Be praying for her as she goes through all of that. So those are just some of the updates that, uh, that we wanted to share with you today. I'm sorry for taking so long. Just it's been one of those weeks. I'm um, going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would and prepare to wait on us as we have our morning ties and offerings. Offering. Gentlemen or ladies, whatever the case may be, would you please come forward? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the life that you are so gracious to share with us. Father, I have no idea what drove all of us to church today. And when I say that, I'm not talking about whether it was a Ford or a Chevy or a Fiat or anything else that we might come up with. But Father, what drove us internally to come to church today? For some, and I would like to believe for the vast majority of us, it was great love for you. Um, Father, you love to hear the worship of your children who are in love with you. But Father, I'm also acutely aware that it's not always love that drives us to worship, to church. Father, I'm aware that sometimes um, we come out of guilt. And if there are those who are here today out of guilt, I hope that they walk away guilt-free. I hope they hear enough and learn enough in both music, prayer, and, and message to realize that once we have been freed from our sin, we are also been set free from the guilt of our sin. Father, I also know that sometimes we are driven to church um, out of frustration. Life has not been good. We feel trapped. We feel irritated and frustrated. We're annoyed and aggravated. And we're looking for something that will soothe the savage beast within us. Settle down our fears. We come because we feel trapped. And we're looking for a way of escape. I hope from Habakkuk today we will learn some lessons or principles that will set us free and bring us to a place of triumphant victory in you. So, Father, we, um, we come into your presence and whatever drove us here. And we can be assured of this one fact. You're here. You always show up. We sometimes don't recognize your presence. We sometimes ignore your presence. And that's why, that's why John wrote that Jesus sometimes stands at the door of the church and he knocks. He wants to be a part of what we do and who we are. For church is not these four walls and a wood floor and a rock wall. The church is a woman named Teresa and a man named Mike and a boy 
named Rick, a young girl named Amanda. It's whoever we are is your church. We've come together today, Father, to adore you and to hear from you. And if there's something that's interfering with that, I trust this would be the moment and this would be the day that we'll get it out of the way. We will receive your forgiveness and we will extend your forgiveness from ourselves to others. Father, for the privilege of giving and sharing today, I trust we will do so with a joy-filled heart because it's an expression of our love and our affection for you. We trust you with the needs that so many families have for care and comfort. We trust you with the needs that so many families and individuals have as they face uncertain medical situations for hope and trust. Thank you for always showing up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody must have thought my battery was low. They left me an extra one. Whew, it's been a good morning. Uh, I invite you to find that little book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. It's where we've been for the last six or seven weeks, and we're going to wrap up there today. So if you will find the little book of Habakkuk, if you are visiting with us for the very first time or you've been out on vacation and haven't been here, you might say, where in the heck is Habakkuk? Easy to find. He's right between Nahum and Zephaniah. <laughs> now, if that doesn't help you at all, it's between Psalms and Matthew, all right? Habakkuk is a little bitty book. It's called a minor prophet. Uh, it's minor not because it is of less importance than the other writers of the Old Testament. It's just, it's smaller. It's kind of like if uh, Tim Belcher was standing up here on stage with me. Tim Belcher, Tim, stand up, stand up. That is a major guy. That's a major Tim. This is a minor Tim, all right? It's the difference in size, okay? And that's the situation with Habakkuk. Um, this is only the second time in my entire lifetime I have ever preached in or out of or through the book of Habakkuk. And I've got to tell you, I, I have fallen in love with it to a greater degree this time than I ever have in the past. It has moved up the ladder of favorites in my life uh, a long, long ways. Um, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you have to understand who Paul is. So just a quick summary in case you don't. Uh, Paul is the author of 13 of the epistles of the New Testament. He, he wrote more of the Bible than anybody else ever has written. Paul's letters are to the church. This is after the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the, the presence of God and the person of the Holy Spirit to come live in your life and mine. And it was through Paul that God addressed most of what you and I need to live life, the Christian life today. It's found in Paul's writings. Paul was a very unique guy to write so much of the Bible. He was unique for a couple of ways. Number one, he was extremely intelligent. If they would have had um, Mensa back in the first century, Paul would have been their first president. All right? Paul was brilliant. Uh, Paul had good family. His family saw that he got the right kind of education. Gamaliel was the greatest teacher of their generation. He's the one who taught Paul. He taught Paul things like philosophy and probably mathematics and, 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 and the key things of their day. But, but Paul also was a good Jewish boy raised in a fine Jewish family. He got the best of the Pharisees and the Sadducees to teach him the Old Testament law, to memorize much of it. So he had his religious training, he had his world training, and when he became a full-grown man, he took seriously the combining of those two things in his life, and he became a zealot for his religion. So much so that chief on, on, on purposes to accomplish in his life was to wipe out this upstart faith-based group called Christians. 
And he went around arresting and killing Christians until he encountered Jesus personally. And his life was changed and then his name was changed. He was no longer Saul of Tarsus. He became Paul the Apostle. And so with that background, it's important to understand what I'm about to say next. With that background, Paul writes in one of his epistles, one of his letters in the New Testament, Paul writes this. Paul says, these things. And when he says these things, he's already talked about these things. Jewish history. The Old Testament, where, we, where we're reading from right now. These things. These were written for a purpose. And he explains the purpose. He said they were written as an allegory. Just to remind you of what allegory means. It's the, it's the uh, image of one thing in the picture of another. In other words, what Paul is saying is the Old Testament is not just a historical record for us to read so that we know history. But contained inside that history are pictures and images of principles and truths that even though Jesus had not come yet when they were written, they were written looking forward to His coming and they have value for us, for us today if by the Holy Spirit's presence in us we will let Him open our eyes and see out of the dusty pages of history lively, vibrant truths that can make a difference in the way in which we live today. Paul is saying, let's not chuck our past. Let's not forget our history but let's learn from it so we can grow. And I've discovered afresh and anew, Habakkuk is one of those books that though it's not an allegory in its truest of sense, it's, it's not so much a picture of one thing helping us to understand another. It's not, it's not like the book of Paul Bunyan. It's not like the book that I talked about last week, Hind's Feet on High Places, that kind of allegory. But, but, but this is an Old Testament guy in serious conversation with God that we call prayer. And though it took place thousands of years ago, it's not dusty or stale. It is fresh and it's vibrant. I, I got to tell you, I think the book of Habakkuk, I think the book of Habakkuk ought to be the book of instruction on prayer. I think more than any other place you can turn throughout the scriptures, I think the lessons to be learned out of the book of Habakkuk on prayer are the best found anywhere in all of scripture. Just like those first century disciples who thought they were defeated, devastated, and destroyed after the death of Jesus Christ. Even after his resurrection, they hid in fear. And just like them, our greatest need today, and maybe, Tim, this is why God moved in your heart to call us out today. Our greatest need today is to see and hear God speak to us. God's greatest desire for us is that we hear about the resurrection of Jesus Christ but not only hear about his resurrection, but we ourselves need to experience his resurrection. Lloyd John Ogilvy, one of my favorite preachers of all time. How many of you have ever heard that name, Lloyd John Ogilvy? Raise your hand. Okay, not very many of you. So, how many of you have never heard of him? Okay, okay, ready to see if you're all awake, all right? Um, Lloyd John Ogilvy used to pastor Hollywood Presbyterian Church when it was one of the biggest churches in the world. All right. He then became the chaplain of the United States Senate. When I had the privilege of working at Fresno Bible House and I became the book and Bible guy, um, I wanted to put on a breakfast. I mean, I'm, I'm the son of a pastor. I wasn't a pastor yet in those days, but I was the son of one. I was the grandson of one. And I knew that one of the greatest challenges that pastors faced was discouragement. And so I wanted to do something to encourage pastors. So I walked into Mr. Jant's office. Lloyd John Ogilvy had a brand new book coming out. 
I wanted to promo the book, and I wanted to encourage pastors. So I walked into Mr. Jantz's office, and Mr. Jantz, I'd like to bring Lloyd John Ogilvy to Fresno, and I'd like to put on a pastor's breakfast that we'll, we'll pay for, Bible House will pay for, but we can also sell a whole lot of Lloyd John Ogilvy's new book. And we can encourage pastors at the same time. Hey, I think it's a win-win situation. He said, Tim, good luck in getting Lloyd John Ogilvy. He said, I, I love that guy, and I have tried to get him here on several other occasions. Good luck. I was expecting a name, a phone number, a call to pave the way for me. I got none of that, all right, other than good luck. <laughs> I was young and foolish. I called 411. Uh, for those of you uh, <laughs> who have no idea what 411 is, uh, that was the original version of Google, okay, for phone numbers, <laughs> all right? Uh, if you needed a phone number, you dial 411 and operator would answer and say, how may I help you? And say, I'm looking for the phone number for Hollywood First Presbyterian Church. And she gave it to me. I dialed that number. I dialed that number, okay? <laughs> I dialed that number. And there was a lovely voice on the other end. And I said, uh, my name is Tim Rowland. I work for Fresno Bible House. I'm calling to speak with Pastor Lloyd John Ogilvie. And she said, just a moment, please. And I got another voice. It was Lloyd's personal secretary. And uh, she said, how may I help you? What would you like to speak to Pastor Ogilvy about? And I explained my story to her. I said, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I am the son of a pastor. I work for Fresno Bible House. Lloyd Donovan has a new book out. I would love to encourage 100 pastors from our community. And God has moved upon my heart that Lloyd John Ogilvy is the one who could best do that. She just starts chuckling. <laughs> and she says, wow. She said, he's... Not available right now, but um, I'll have him call you. It wasn't 10 minutes at the Bible house, and there's a message on the phone. Tim, there's a call for you online, too. I picked up the phone, and I said, this is Tim. Hi, Tim. This is Lloyd John Ogilvy. <laughs> he had the deepest, richest, mellow voice you could ever imagine. My knees buckled. I told him my story, and he said, when would you like me to come? I said, yes! We scheduled the date. It took a little bit to work it out, but we scheduled the date, and he came. And um, I remember introducing him to all the pastors, and we had like, it was the biggest breakfast we'd ever had for pastors in the Valley at that time. And um, I remember introducing Lloyd John Ogilvie for the first time, and I, I told folks this. I said, ladies and gentlemen, when I die and go to heaven, if God does not sound like Lloyd John Ogilvie, I am going to be disappointed. <laughs> He just, I mean, he just, he had this voice. It was unbelievable. And here is what, I told you all of that to tell you this. Lloyd John Ogilvy said, the most powerful historical proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is his resurrected disciples. So the question I have for you and myself today is this. Am I any proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are you any proof that Jesus is risen from the dead? Dull, defeated people can become fearless, adventuresome leaders. Cowards become courageous. The timid become triumphant. The inept do the impossible. He is risen. Because the joyous chant of new life without limits is flowing through us. Prayer. Prayer like Habakkuk prayed. Is the link that connects us with God. Prayer is the bridge that spans every gulf. And it bears us over every valley of danger or trouble or need. How significant is this picture of prayer to us in the New Testament church? Think about the moment in the book of Acts when Peter was in prison. The Jews were triumphant because they thought Jesus was dead and the, the big mouth of Christianity was now incarcerated. Herod was supreme on the face of the earth. The arenas of martyrdom and death awaits the dawning of the next day. But prayer, prayer was made without ceasing by the church of God on behalf of Peter. And how does that story end? Late that night, the prison doors flew open. 
Peter walked out and was set free. The Jews were baffled at what happened to him. The wicked king was divinely smitten down. And the word of God rolled on into great victory. And the disciples of Jesus turned the world upside down. Do you and I know the power of our supernatural weapon called communion with God? God grants to you and me a holy audacity and a divine confidence to be in conversation with him. God is not looking for great men and women, but he's wanting men and women who will prove the greatness of God in their life. Are you ready to be one of those? When Napoleon of France fought Wellington of England, all England waited patiently for the word of that decisive battle at Waterloo. When the message made its way back to London, it was to be relayed by flags at the top of Winchester Cathedral. The flags on the cathedral began to spell out the message, Wellington defeated. But before the message could be finished, a heavy fog rolled in and settled down, and they couldn't see the flags anymore. Gloom filled the hearts of the people. As the fragmentary news spread throughout the surrounding countryside, Wellington defeated but after a couple of hours and the fog mist began to lift, it became evident they only had half the message. For the full message is this, Wellington defeated Napoleon. When we feel defeated and we find ourselves in a fog of growing impatience, I want to urge us to look to the clear promises of God and see how the Lord plans finally our end as good, not bad. For God is filled with tenderness and mercy for us. And this book of Habakkuk, it is the prayer of a man who is going right at this moment through the valley of deep sorrow and trouble. This is a prayer that you and I can learn from and grow from. This is a prayer that teaches much about ourselves and even more about God. This little book is a conversation with an unchanging God and an ever-changing man. This prayer reveals the faithfulness of God even when we do not recognize it. And it also reveals the fickleness of ourselves even when we choose not to like it. This little bitty minor prophet, Habakkuk needs to become one of our best friends. You see, God directed Habakkuk to get personal as he wrote this book. And Habakkuk held nothing back. I got to be honest, I love the frankness of Habakkuk in this book. He, he, he reveals his warts, his pimples, his scars, and everything. He offers to us so much in a short brief of time that it's like drinking from a fire hose. What I'm going to do over the next several minutes is, is if you miss this series, you're going to get caught up in the final sermon. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of all three chapters. I'm going to hit the highlights, and I'm going to tell you a thing or two I probably didn't tell you when I went through the chapter all by itself. I'm going to, I'm going to go quickly. Put your tinny runners on, all right? I'm going to go quickly. Um, and then we're going to wrap up looking at something. And, I, man, Tim and Milo, you guys could have had no way of knowing that the, the songs were absolutely perfect for this message today. I love it when God does that. All right, chapter 1. The, the, the chapter summary, and, and let me just read a couple of verses. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O oh Lord, must I call you for help, and you do not listen? How often must I cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction of violence is before me. There's strife and conflict everywhere. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous. You talk about a whiner. <sighs> One complaint after another. Habakkuk does most of the talking in chapter 1. He talks at the beginning. He talks at the end. He gives God a little bit of time in the middle. That sounds an awful lot like your prayer life. It doesn't end very good. It doesn't end well when we do that. What we find in this chapter is an unanswered prayer, an unexpected plan, and for the moment, what seems to be an unsolved problem. See, sometimes we think when we pray, we're going to get all the answers just like that. We sometimes think when we pray, it's like rubbing a lamp and the genie's going to show up and everything's going to be fixed right then and there. 
most of us did not get into trouble overnight and we will not get out of the predicament overnight even with God's intervention. We are the product sometimes of our circumstances and God will allow those circumstances to be iron that sharpens iron, to be learning lessons for us. What was Habakkuk's attitude in this? Well, in verses 1 through 4, it's laid out for us. Habakkuk was a wondering and worrying prophet at this moment. He wonders where God is and he worries what is God going to do. Habakkuk's thought about God in this chapter is he believes that God is indifferent, inactive, and inconsistent. You ever felt that way about God? Maybe you're here today and you feel that way about him. What I would suggest to you is it is often not God who is indifferent, inactive, or inconsistent, but it tends to be us who are indifferent about God's and God's truth. It is us who tend to be inactive about God's leadership in our life, and it's us who tends to be inconsistent in the development and nurturing of our faith. But this is Habakkuk's story. God's response is found in verses 5 through 11. And here's what God tells Habakkuk. He tells Habakkuk, hey, since you're wondering and worrying, I'm going to tell you, watch and see. Watch and see what I've done in the past, and watch and see what I have planned for your future. And by the way, folks, God is never caught without a plan. May I say it this way? God has never, ever once been caught with his pants down. I wasn't sure I could say that about God, but I'm still here, and I said it in the 8 o'clock service. So, I, it didn't offend him too badly, all right? God is never, ever caught with his pants down. God is never caught without a plan. The Bible says it this way. Before the creation of the world, God said, I have a plan of redemption. Before I've ever created man and before he's ever had a chance to fall, I already have a plan to recover him from his mess-ups. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and he didn't give him to him at, 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 at 3 B.C. He gave his son Jesus to the world before the foundation of the world had ever been created. He's never caught without a plan. God tells Habakkuk, my work will be amazing and unbelievable. That's found in verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something in your day that you cannot believe. And if you read on, you will discover that he will be deliberate and diligent. There's a couple of things to remember out of chapter 1. As you put it together in its whole context, you will discover that God is holy. You will discover that we as people are helpless. And we will learn most of all, the enemy who tries to destroy us is haughty and arrogant. He thinks he's one. Chapter 2, a summary of chapter 2 is, is this, this is a good one. In chapter 2, God does most of the talking. Habakkuk is doing more listening in chapter 2 than talking. And that's a very powerful principle, for it is in chapter 2 that Habakkuk learned something that changed his attitude, and we'll notice that attitude shift when we get to chapter 3. He learned what God was telling him in verse 4. All right, verse 4 of chapter 2. The righteous will live by his faith. Powerful principle here. The righteous will live by their faith. The righteous do not live by what they see. The righteous do not live by their circumstance. The righteous shall live by faith. And why do you think God shared that valuable principle with Habakkuk right then? Why do you think it's true that the righteous shall live by faith? This is just going to knock your socks off when you hear the answer to this. Do you know the reason that this is a key principle for life today? It's because God is just and God is faithful. The righteous shall live by faith. Why? Because God is just. The righteous shall live. The just shall live by faith. Why? Because God is faithful. God has always, Old Testament, New Testament, 21st century, God has always wanted to reveal himself to the world through his people. Always. Think about it with me for just a moment. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Why does God tell us not to steal? Because God's not a thief. Thou shalt not lie. Why does he tell us not to lie? Because God is not a liar. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? God is not an adulterer. The Ten Commandments were given in the Old Testament to reveal through his people his character through Israel. 
Now, if that's not enough for you, go to the New Testament. Go read Galatians chapter 5, last part of the chapter all over again. What are you going to find there? You scholars, what will you find in Galatians 5? How about the fruit of the Spirit? Okay, fruit of the Spirit's listed there. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and against such things there is no law. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is the presence of the Holy Spirit living within our human spirit to bring in and through us the character of God the Father to communicate himself to the world. God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is kindness. God is goodness. It has always been God's plan, never caught with his pants down, to reveal himself through us to the world. That's what he's telling Habakkuk in chapter 2. What is Habakkuk's attitude is God is doing most of the talking now and he is doing most of the listening. And for us to get to that place, there needs to be an attitude shift in our hearts. As long as we're doing a lot of talking, we're going to grumble and complain, and there's not going to be a significant attitude shift. But when we shut up long enough to listen to God speak to us, there is a difference. And in chapter 2, in the few verses in chapter 2 that Habakkuk speaks, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch, and I will look to see what God is going to say. And what answer I am to give to my complaints. In other words, I'm going to stop complaining and I'm going to wait for the answer that God gives to me. In the first chapter, Habakkuk is just passive. He says, I'll watch and see. Chapter 2, he's aggressive. I will stand and see. Habakkuk, instead of complaining says, I will wait and see what God has to say about all this. And what is God's response in chapter 2? God reminds Habakkuk of an, of, a, of, of an unfaithful person's conduct. How does a person behave who is unfaithful? They will be proud in their hearts. What does pride in the heart do? Makes, makes us think we're bigger than we are and other people are less than we are. What does pride in our heart do? Puts within us a spirit of unforgiveness and we hold grudges. It's what the pride in heart does. You'll be perverse in your thinking. They're going to have to forgive me before I forgive them. That's perverse. God says you and I are to forgive in the same way that God in Christ has forgiven us. We'll be perverse in our thinking. We'll flip-flop the morals of God and we'll substitute our own morality for it. And we will be restless in our souls. When we don't live by faith in this unchangeable God, we become very restless in our hearts. And it's why Jesus extended the invitation, come unto me, all you are weary and tired of life, and I'll give you rest for your souls. God also reminds Habakkuk of how a believer lives. That a believer in verse 2 and 4, he will confide in God's word, he'll write it down so he doesn't forget it, and he'll pass it on so others will discover the truth. And number two, found in verse 4, believers live by faith. God also warns Habakkuk to beware of corrupt possessions in verse 6. Don't let your life be about what you collect and buy. He worries, he challenges him about corrupt power, verse 9. He, he warns Habakkuk about corrupt people and relationships. Guys, you are either going to be an influencer or an influencee. One is not really better or worse than the other. Not everybody is going to be real leaders, but everybody can be influencers. But if you tend to be a personality which is influenced by others around you rather than, rather than you being a cup of tea, <laughs> a tea bag that influences its environment, then you need to be very careful in the people you hang out with until you have gotten to such a place in your spiritual growth and strength that you can influence others rather than be influenced by them, you need to be very, very careful. To those of you who are teenagers in here, you need to choose your friends wisely. Those of you who are single, you better choose carefully who you marry. Very, very wisely. God also assures Habakkuk that there are three things that he can count on. God's grace will always be evident, verse 4. God's glory will show up to redeem you in the most unusual of places. And God's government, verse 20, is never out of place. Verse 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be what? Silent before him. Habakkuk had learned that lesson. I opened this prayer. I'm going to let God finish it. I'm going to let God do most of the talking. And by the way, where is the holy temple? It's not in Jerusalem. It's not at 4620 East Knees. The New Testament, Paul says, your body, 
My body is the holy temple of the living God. So shut up and listen to what God has to say to you. A couple things to remember as we wrap up chapter 2. We do not live by explanations. It's the last song we just sang. We do not live by explanation but by promises. I took Algebra 2 and Trigonometry in the 10th grade. I did not understand one thing that teacher taught me that year. Not a thing. I couldn't tell you a thing that I remembered. Now, what I did have going for me was this. I had a very, very good memory. I'm, I, I'm a rote memorizer, all right? I, I memorize scripture by saying it again and again and again and again. And there were scriptures I memorized as a kid. I didn't have one clue what they meant, but I could quote the scripture to you. I passed trigonometry and, and algebra 2 not because I understood one thing they taught me, but because I could memorize formulas. And the reason I don't remember them today is because they had absolutely no application to what I do in life. Now, for those of you who do things that that makes sense to, that's great. But for me, it didn't. And so I didn't even worry about trying to hang on to it. And sometimes we do that very same, with, same thing with Scripture. We don't think it has application to my life. So it's in one ear and it's out the other. But peace, joy, rest, contentment, and all the promises that God has for us, we are to live on the promises, not the explanation. Chapter 3, I've got to wrap up really fast, six minutes, and I'll be only five minutes late. <laughs> Chapter summary, we go from trapped to triumphant. Chapter 1, Habakkuk is a trapped prophet. Chapter 3, he's triumphant. It's what happens when we listen more than we speak. Habakkuk's attitude, verses 1 through 4, we find him in a kneeling position of prayer and worship. Habakkuk's thoughts in this last chapter, he prays, verses 1 and 2. He ponders, 3 through 15. He praises in the last few verses that we looked at closely last week. What does he ponder about? He ponders about whatever is good and just and truthful. That's what Paul said is, think on these things. God's response, God comes, God stood, God marched, God crushed, God stripped, God pierced, God trampled. That's verses 3 through 15. Whoa, be careful when God marches into a room. Do you know what happened when your mother marched into your bedroom with that look on her face? The earth trembled. Go, go read this chapter. That's exactly what happened when God marched into the scene. The earth trembled. And why does God do all this? Because found in verse 13, God said, I'll deliver my people. If you are in need of rescue, listen to God. He will show up. And then he enables us to have strength to walk in high places in verse 9. Let me wrap this up. According to verses 16 through 18, we have two choices on how to respond with the circumstances in our life. I shouldn't have closed my Bible so quickly. I want you to notice verse 16. I heard my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. What's that a picture of? Fear. That's how we feel when fear sneaks into our hearts. Decay, trembling. Or, yet... I will wait patiently for the day of calamity that's coming to the nation invading us. Yet, verse 18, I will yet, this is yet faith, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And if I will express yet faith in my circumstances, I will be able to rejoice and he will give me strength, clarity, and invigoration. When you are able to go where only, where only the mountain goats can go. What do you have up there you don't get anywhere else? You get a view of things like you could never have. Clarity comes to play. And I got to tell you, when you hang your feet off a 10,000-foot mountain, there is nothing so invigorating in life as seeing all of God's grandeur and all of God's strength. Last week I told you I would briefly mention the Selahs. Tim probably knows this because he's, he's a worship leader. Did you know the book of Habakkuk is the only place in all the Bible outside of the Psalms that the word Selah is used? Only place. And it's used in chapter 3, three times. Wow. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's kind of a Trinity thing here going on. The first time it's used is at the end of verse 3. And guess what Habakkuk, and, and, and here's what the word Selah means. Stop and think clearly. Stop being rattled by your circumstances and think clearly about what God has to say. And at the end of verse 3, what Habakkuk's been thinking about is what God has done in the past. And do you know what he says? Do it again. What's the last song we just sang? Do it again. Wow. Isn't God good? Could we have planned? Did we plan that? Did you know I was going to be here today? 
man, no, you didn't. Well, you knew I was going to be here, but you didn't know I was going to say that. The second one is in verses 3 through 9. At the end of verse 9, there's another Selah. And this is after Habakkuk has remembered how God had stepped into the history of Israel again and again and again at, at the most incredible times, and he rescued them. And Habakkuk, with his memory working now, rather than his fear directing his thought, Habakkuk says, Selah, God, do it again. Do it again. And the third one. Habakkuk wants the nation restored. He wants their possessions and their position back where God wants them to be. And verse 11 describes what God did in Joshua chapter 10 where Israel was in the process of achieving a tremendous victory, but they needed the day to last a little longer. And Joshua prayed, God, could you make the sun stand still? And God did. And they end up finishing the victory and they had peace in the land. And Habakkuk remembers how they were restored to victory. And he says, Selah, God, do it again. Do it again. Guys, do you see why Habakkuk ought to become our best friend? It teaches us so much about communion with God. Do you need to stop and ponder Think about what God has done in your past and his promises of what he will do for you right now and in the future. And let's begin to live by yet faith. And let's be people who kneel and worship rather than watch and wait if God can do something. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are God that teaches us from history past. You teach us from history past how to live in the present moment. You didn't record these things just to give us a history of the past, but you recorded these things so that we would have lessons for the present. Father, I pray that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and then most important of all, wills that will submit to your leadership. If we arrived here today trapped, God, not by anything that I have said or Kepler has said today, but God, by what your spirit has communicated to our hearts, may we leave here today triumphant, ready to see what it is you're going to do next. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Quick question before you get up. You can say no. It's okay. Did you enjoy the study of an Old Testament book like Habakkuk? Was that good? Okay. All right. All right. All right. So if I do another one, it'll be okay. Okay. All right. What we're going to do next then, I don't, I don't want to bail out on the Minor Prophets yet. We're going to go to the other H brother. Okay. We've been in Habakkuk. We're, we're going to jump over to Haggai or Haggai, whichever way you want to pronounce it. All right. We're going to go. He, he's, a, he's a Minor Prophet too. He's not any taller. And, 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 and we're going to look at Haggai then. So here's your homework assignment. Find where Haggai is in the Bible. I'm not going to ask you to read it because I asked you to do that for Habakkuk and only five of you did. So just, just find it. Just find it, okay? God bless you. Go have a good afternoon. Go check out the sausage. <laughs>